During the following program, look for the main PBS web markers, which indicate there is in-depth information about main authors and their books on our website. You told me once that it was fun being famous for about five minutes. Well, I've only been really famous in, in Holland for, uh, say, six months or so, just before I left. And it's not pleasant. Because it always happens when beautiful women come on to you when you're with your wife, your child, and your dog. You know, what are you going to do? Production of A Good Read on Main PBS is made possible in part by the Davis Family Foundation. The diner was housed in a ramshackle building still elegant in its old age, surrounded by a gallery of chiseled, slender posts under a moss and lichen-covered shingled roof. Hi, I'm Sandy Fippen, your host of A Good Read. Jan Willem van der Vettering has now produced over 30 books for adults and children has had his work translated into 15 languages and has fans all over the world. So why would a former Dutch policeman, aspiring Buddhist monk, motorcycle gang member, and jazz aficionado want to settle here on the main coast where he has lived for the last 25 years? That may be Van de Vettering's greatest tale of them all. Somehow I got into writing children's books. I don't know how that happened. I, uh, I'm not particularly good with kids. When they come and see me, I have a box of toys and I, I let them play with it. I, I don't know what to do with kids. But I write books for them. And they're always about this character, Hugh Pine, who's a porcupine who lives in the main woods. And Hugh is a very clever porcupine. And so all the, the animals in the woods come to see him and with all their problems. They always have problems. And he gets very tired of that. He doesn't want to be a guru. And he discovered this island that he can see from the tree where he lives in. And he wants to live there. And his friend in town is called Mr. McTosh, who is a postmaster. And you says, Mr. McTosh, yes, you. Do you see the island there? Mr. McTosh looked, surely you. I sometimes stop there when I go fishing. Does anyone live there? Mr. McTosh scratched his whiskers. No, it's rather small, you know. Just a hill with a pine tree and some bushes below. Nobody out there, rather a lonely place, I would say. Mr. McTosh? Yes, you. Would you take me there? Just for a look, asked Mr. McTosh. I'd like to live there. Live there, Mr. McTosh asked. But you, you'll be all alone. There's plenty to eat, but you won't have any company. That's nice, you said firmly. Could you take me there now? Jan Willem, is Maine the answer to your lifelong quest, living here in Maine? Well, my lifelong quest is, is for meaning, but uh, for location, yes, it is definitely the place. You know? and, and every time I'm out of it, I realize it. When, when you're in it, you're, I mean, you're so happy, you're so contented that uh, what what more can you possibly want? You know, it's you can park in front of the front of the bank. You you can park in front of the supermarket. The supermarket has everything you've ever thought of. And, and five minutes later, you can be uh, between the islands and not see a soul except uh, seals and, and dolphins and eagles. And I can see four eagles sometimes here, right from my my window. I think this is the place. I really don't think I will do much traveling anymore. I'm, I'm 70 now. I'll spend my uh, twilight here in a resounding memory. On the main coast? On the main coast. What did you know about Maine before you moved here 25 years ago? Nothing, nothing. All I knew, Walter Norwick lived here. I, I knew Walter Norwick in, uh, in Japan. And years later, I went across him. Uh, in Amsterdam, and he told me he'd started a Zen place here, and Zen was one of my uh, my big interests. This was in the 60s, and I started commuting because I had to go from Amsterdam to New York, Boston, Chicago for business. So I looked at the map and I saw where Maine was, and I figured out a way of 
flying to Maine on my way home. And I would visit uh, Norwalk Center in Surrey, Maine for many years. And then when I started be, uh, selling my books in, in Amsterdam and doing so well with it, I thought, I, I, why, why live in Europe and pay these taxes if you can pay and uh, live in America and live a reasonable life financially? And buy land. In Holland, you can't buy land. There's no land. People say, you wanted to buy land, <laughs> just look at you, you know. <laughs> 16 million people in half the state of Maine, where, where are you going to buy land? And here, with my first royalty check, I, uh, I bought all this land here. I couldn't believe the price of it. And the locals were saying, what did you pay for it? You're out of your mind. My grandfather used to buy land here for $300. And what did you say you paid? You know? In Holland, it would have been millions. What was your plan for this place? Did you design the whole no, setup? No, I just bought it to sell it. I'm a Dutchman, you know. <laughs> a trader. It was uh, cheap, and I thought I'd buy it, and I'll sell it again. But then when I saw how beautiful it was, and to the water, uh -huh. uh, and I had this friend who wanted to build stuff, and I, I ran into some salvage material from Bar Harbor. It all came together, you know. It was pure happenstance. And all these buildings suddenly uh, started to appear. All the buildings have sort of an oriental flavor to them. Yeah, because my friend was from, uh, had been in Japan and he'd taken thousands of photographs of buildings. And you have the main house, uh, and then you have your writing house, yeah. and then you have another little place down near the water where, yeah, you, can, where yeah. you can meditate. I don't know how that happened, but <laughs> it's like a little village. It's fun throughout the house and not around your property, it's just fun being here. And, and all of a sudden something will pop out of the field or out of a tree, out of the woods. You've got this, uh, a piece of driftwood with mm. eyeballs or something. But no, it's too much uh, stuff. This one I've never been in before. Jukebox, nudes. Everything. <laughs> and spirits of the uh, wild country. <laughs> Plays all jazz. Oh, it won't play anything else. Just jazz. I've tried, no, but right, it right. won't do it. No pop music. No. And no classical music. No. No. It's no. Hiccups. <laughs> well, thank you for showing me that. Before coming to Maine, let's go back now. Let's fill in the history. You were born and raised in Rotterdam. Rotterdam. Yeah. In 1931. Yeah. And uh, experienced World War II. Grew up in a wealthy family, and what happened? What what brought you to this quest? I mean, during I know that you've told me that in World War II, the school you went to uh, had a lot of Jewish kids in it. Well, it wasn't that wasn't the start of it. You know, I grew up in ideal circumstance. We had a nice house, nice parents. I was married, we were together, uh, brothers and sisters. You know? I was the youngest one. We had uh, German. Uh, People in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. They taught me how to sing. You know, I thought that the German was a beautiful language. We had German friends, business friends, bring presents. So I thought things were just great, you know. And I was told God is in heaven, and He's He's created all this to uh, for fun. So we're having a good time here. So things were okay. Uh, but then I began to notice a few things that weren't quite the way they should be. Uh, in fact, they were not at all the way they should be. I discovered poverty. They were uh, right behind our avenue. The poor quarter started. And the, the 30s was a crisis, the depression. Right. And people were hungry. And there was a big um, revolt in the street, riots. Uh -huh. And the Dutch military police came in with their bearskin hats and their sabers and sticks and actually killed some people. By I was there, you know, with my father. We happened to be walking there on our way to Sunday school, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I said, what, what happened? What's wrong with these people? And I, my father said, they're hungry, they're unemployed. So I thought, uh, you know, this was my first doubt about the, uh, the great scheme of things being good. You told me once that you had your doubts and then Yes. When you see the, the mountains on uh, Mount Desert Island, mm -hmm. you have 
Yes. At least some comfort, but That's I right. didn't have any mountains to look <laughs> at. And but what I did have to look at a little later was uh, German bombers flying very low over the city. And these were Germans; they're supposed to be good people. Mm -hmm. And they didn't even use their fancy bombers on us. They used these uh, cargo planes, and they had uh, sliding doors. And I could see the air soldiers throwing out bombs, trying to kill me. You know what the hell had I done? They destroyed your father's factory, didn't they? Yeah, everything. Mm -hmm. You know, you had warehouses with coffee, and they burned. It was a pretty sight to see it burn. It smelled good too. <laughs> but. So there was an exciting side about war too. You know, to, just to see these planes, and later to see the German tanks coming in in the early morning fog, and the soldiers walking there. You know. So there was adventures, but it wasn't. It wasn't what they told me. You know, it was. And you you grew up Protestant. Yeah. Right. Very uh, Calvinistic. Mm-hmm. And then at school, I went to the best school for kids in, in Rotterdam, and all the children of the rich Jewish businessmen were there, and they were gradually uh, uh, being deported, and I saw some more gruesome scenes. And I thought, well, uh, maybe it's because we're rich, and we're taken to school in Mercedes and Rolls Royces, and there are these poor people, you know. So there's some justice here, and we're being punished for being uh, being rich. But they never came for me, and I, I said, "Why not?" And uh, oh, you're not Jewish. And, What's Jewish? You know, I'm nine years old. What the hell is Jewish? So I'm beginning to have some f severe doubts, and uh, and f I, I chucked out the Bible. I, I thought this is not the right book. You know, they've been telling me lies here. Did you lose close friends, Jewish friends, who were? Oh, my old, uh, my, all my schoolmates. Oh, your schoolmates, right? Yeah, yeah. And they were I was, uh, I had the private tuition after them. Yeah, I can still see them, you know. Mm -hmm. But they're of course, they're all ten years old. I can see their clothes and the. Uh, Did you actually see them taken away out of oh, the school? Oh yeah, yeah. Out of I the saw school? them being marched to the cattle cars, and because mm -hmm. uh, I, I made a point of going to see that, you know, I was very curious. Right. Disgusting, you know? but it's not just the Jews. I mean, uh, this has been going on as long as uh, human beings have been around. Right, right. And finally, it, it set me off on a philosophical search, which was very similar to what you had in America here in the Beatnik generation. Because, but I was all on my own. I didn't have uh, a whole group of people backing me up. I, uh, the Dutch didn't really go for a Beatnikery. Mm -hmm. So you went to London first, didn't you? you go to school uh, well, in London? first I went to Africa to, Africa, to work. To your uncle's, uncle's, uh, to uncle's uh, My father's mine. business there, and okay. uh, he fired me for being obnoxious <laughs> and uh, not very punctual. This about was South, Afri hours. South yeah. Africa, was it? Cape Town. Yeah. Cape Town, right, that's right. So I, I got odd jobs, and I became an intellectual motorcycle gang member. Mm -hmm. Based on a on a novel by Dostoevsky called *The Young Demons*, which has just been published again in a new translation. I must get that. And but then, then you went to London. Then I went to London and studied philosophy, because my father had died by then and left me some money. And my professor at the university got irritated by my uh, questioning and doubting, and he said, "It seems to me that the only answer." For you, it would be nihilism, and you have already tried that. But you should try to go a little further and and look into Buddhism, which is a nihilistic religion. You might like that. And there's the teachers, and he uh, suggested I'd go to to Japan. So you found your way to Japan, and you actually had the gall to go up to this uh, elitist Zen Buddhism. Place yeah, because knock that on was the door. my old Christian upbringing. You know, if you knock on the door, it'll open. So I thought, if I make the effort, uh, the spirits will be uh, helpful, and they were. Mm -hmm. They let you in. They let me in. Right, and you worked with this master for two, uh, one and a half years. Yeah, and he was just wonderful. He was. Almost a fairy tale master. You know, he looked the part. He he behaved. He had a great sense of humor. He uh, he was completely detached because he was dying of advanced Parkinson's disease. So uh, he he was really free of, of it all. And that's what Buddhism is about, isn't it? Yeah, about becoming free. Free. Yeah. 
Uh, did you know much about Buddhism before? Yeah, I read everything right. I could find, but okay. uh, but books are books. I mean, it's uh, it gives you some intellectual understanding, but the nice thing about Buddhism is, is that there is actual practice and actual live teachers that you can be with. Uh, why did you think that that was a waste of time at the time? Well, there were monks, you know, and uh, I'm not a monk. Did you want to be a monk, though? No, no. Oh. I just wanted some answers. I didn't want okay. to be a monk. Okay. So I was, I was uh, really out of place there, and uh, I couldn't see myself as a religious person. It's, it's against my whole being. That was one thing that I began to understand after two years. Another thing was that I had a bad drinking habit, and it uh, com com doesn't combine very well <laughs> with uh, with a, a Zen training monastery, and they were having some trouble putting up with me. You know. I would walk through paper doors and stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I had to fix them again. You know. <laughs> and I was very uh, much uh, in awe uh, and admiration of the teacher. Uh, but he kept asking me the same question and never accepting any of my answers. So that was getting a little old, too. Uh -huh. I left and I went to Colombia, uh, where I could get a job. An old friend of mine had a business there, and then I went to Peru. I got married there. And I went to Australia, working for Dutch comp companies. And then finally I went back to Amsterdam because somebody offered me a very nice job right in the center of Amsterdam. And I liked that. But then the police got, I got arrested for dodging the draft. And I hadn't dodged the draft. I, I had paperwork to prove it, but it was, it was, a they, they could still get me if they wanted me. Because I hadn't told them about changing my address. And if they, Holland had attacked Russia, they wouldn't have been able to find me. You know? <laughs> So in order to get out of the military, I volunteered for the police at their suggestion as a regular reserve cop. cop. A reserve but cop. I had a regular uniform, regular training too, but it was, I wasn't paid. It was evenings and weekends, and I did that uh, for seven years. So you decided to combine your interest in Buddhism with your police experience, and you invented these two detectives. Yeah, well, I didn't really decide, you know. People always say, then I decided to do this and that. It just happened. Things happened. Had you written before then? I mean, were you writing all along? I wrote The Empty Mirror, my first book about the Japanese experience, mm -hmm. and that sold very well in America. Then you wrote a second book here uh, called yeah. A Glimpse of Nothingness, yeah. which was about your Zen experiences in Maine, right? Yeah, and I made it appear as if it was just one consecutive period, but it really was about 20 visits that I'd done when I was still commuting. And I put them all together into one. So is your new book, After Zen, you know, the new book, is that like, can you say that's a trilogy now? I wanted to, uh, to sum up what happened there. Because I'm very grateful to the Zen experience, but I don't want anything more to do with it. So you don't meditate at all anymore? Here? No, you, no. Did you no. ever have a meditation room here or when you first built the house? And no, I mean, not well. You no daily rituals? I, had, I still have a, a ritual that I've made up myself. Okay. Can you tell us about that? Uh, well, what do I do? <laughs> I burn incense and I, I chant a sutra and I ring bells mm -hmm. to give a little structure to the day. And I clap clappers and then, uh, if at all possible, I go out in my boat and row for a long time, and uh, just look at things. The main massacre, that's when I discovered you. I remember that first book. And where you brought your two detectives to Maine yeah. from Amsterdam. And then you worked in the Buddhism also. So we had these uh, hybrid thrillers uh, set in Maine. And since then, you've mentioned Maine a lot in a number of other books. Uh, how would you describe your two detectives, the two famous detectives? Well, they're really both uh, projections of myself. One, uh, Gerbsla, is the uh, heavy set, solid, uh, bourgeois, structural guy, you know. 
But he's probably the most intelligent of them all. And the gear is, is a fancy version of myself. I made him taller and wider shoulders, narrower hips, and bigger moustache, better teeth, bigger brown eyes. And he's an athlete. And he's a good shot. And, uh, but he's not a, he doesn't like football. That's the only part where we... Uh, and he never has a steady love affair. He has lots of little love affairs. Mm -hmm. There's also a third character, the Commissaris, that you use. Well, he is a combination of the uh, Zen master I had of my father and the chief of detectives I worked under in, uh, in Amsterdam. He was a very interesting guy. How many children's books have you done now? You've done the Hugh Pine series. You had I've done four Hugh Pines. So th only three were published here. And one and little owl, it's called. A little owl, and then the, I'm writing... A, I just finished writing a... A book for my German publisher for a, 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 an eight-year-old detective. An eight-year-old? Yeah, <laughs> he drives a tractor, a garden <laughs> tractor. Now there have been also a, other series of novels and books of short stories and experimental books like the Murder by Remote Control book yeah. that was cartoons. The cartoons, and I'm, I'm working on a book now where I want to do the drawings with little short texts. It's a book about death. And because uh, I, I went to Mexico, where, where all these, these death uh, experiences, the day of the dead, and all, that really turned me on. You always have several books going, don't you? That's yeah, what you're telling me. Yeah. I know in your house, your other house, not this one, your, your writing house, you have a book going upstairs and one downstairs. I remember you showing me that once. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I, right now I have four different projects I'm working on, plus a movie, plus something else. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. And uh, and I'm not. I'm just goofing off all the time. You know, I should be working. But I, I'm just waiting for it to hit me, and then I can work for a week, and I'll, I'll work till four o'clock in the morning, and it'll 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 just come out. Movies have been made and television shows from your works. Have you been satisfied with the film versions of your books? No. <laughs> In Europe, you're very popular. Uh, how do you explain that compared to in the United States, where you're more of a cult figure? Can we say that? No, yeah, well, popularity. I was very popular in Holland for a while, and then I got completely forgotten. I'm not even in print there. In Germany, I got forgotten too, and I'm coming back again because I discovered I'm a philosophical, philosophical crime writer. But it's not really all that big, and in France, uh, I've never been out of print, but I've never really been a big-time writer either. And in America, with the empty mirror, I was to catch me out, but then I wasn't in the country. And since then, I've always been in print. You told me once that it was fun being famous for about five minutes. Well, I've only been really famous in, in Holland for, uh, say, six months or so, just before I left. And it's not pleasant. Because it always happens when beautiful women come on to you when you're with your wife, your child, and your dog. You know, what are you going to do? Or uh, lesbian women come on to you and say you write nasty about women. And you have to defend yourself, you know. Mm -hmm. Me? Well, nasty about women? I'm not nasty about women. Well, what do you mean by that, you know? And they're big butcher ladies and... <laughs> They're going to kill you. <laughs> or or you want, you're in a hurry to catch a tram and somebody stops you and tells you a story of his life. Yeah. It, it never gets you when you want it and it gets you when you don't want it. It's a terrible punishment. On the other hand, it seems pleasing to the ego. 
Right. Back to the ego again. But you have you completely, your ego is gone? Have you, have you, did you succeed in erasing your ego? <laughs> <laughs> You're kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Visit our website for more information about A Good Read and the writers featured in this series, including a transcript of the interviews, biographies of each of the authors, a complete list of their published works, some tips on how to find those books, what's on their own must-read book list, and more. Production of A Good Read on Maine PBS is made possible in part by the Davis Family Foundation. We are not human beings having a spiritual adventure. We are spiritual beings having a human adventure. It was written all over this car. And I thought, this is it, you know, this is wonderful, this is exactly what, what, what we are. So who, who is in the car, God? You know? <laughs> it was just a, a middle-aged lady. And I said, where do you find that? She said, I just thought of it, and I wrote it myself. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful.